and helpful. And those characteristics are the qualities of Jesus. When people show those traits, they are angels in a sense, or messengers for Christ. We see these traits displayed in many ways. James writes of what Rahab did when she welcomed the spies. We read about this in James chapter 2. The spies in Greek is the same word that usually is translated angels. And the word means messenger. These two men were messengers of what they saw at Jericho when they took the message back to, to Joshua. Well, in a sense, we can be messengers. We can be angels. Representing the love and the kindness and the consideration and the compassion of Jesus to other people. I just read this example about an oncology nurse who was sent like an angel to help a mother who was dying of cancer. And while living eight years ago, she said to the nurse, before she even said anything, I just felt comfort. It was almost like somebody just put a warm blanket on me. I've never felt anything like that before or any other connection with anybody else. The oncology nurse knew that she that mother who was dying of cancer thought of her as an angel. Trisha thought of her as the one. The one for what? She was a single mom. She had one little one boy, eight years old. The single mom, this, this one was the one, the one to take and raise her son. And then she and her husband, that's the way it's been for the last eight years. All along, the mother had little gifts to give. One was a key ring when he turned 16, got his driver's license. And now eight years have passed, and he's got his driver's license, so Tricia, his stepmom, gave him a key ring. And did I mention his mom and stepmom have the same name? Tricia? That's something. Wesley. The son has adjusted to the loss of his mother, and why not? He had two angels sent to help him. His mother and his stepmom. That story brings me to something you might think is unrelated but isn't. The apostles John, Peter, and Paul use the death and resurrection of Jesus as a motivational factor for us in several ways. This is the passage I quoted earlier. This is how we know what Jesus, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ led in his life for us. And we ought to lead in our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be any? Dear children, let's not love with words and tongue, but with actions and in truth. And so if we do that, we'll be angels, messengers for Christ, what of his love and his kindness. Outside the city walls near a limestone quarry with the strange face of a skull, Golgotha, outlined on the side of a cliff, Roman soldiers crucified Jesus. Paul wrote, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus' love, we see it. He had his unwavering determination to die on the cross for everyone and then be raised. He was determined to die on the cross for us. This was paramount. This was the most important thing to him. His love was complete for everyone. He treated, there was no partiality on his part. In fact, when he said at the Last Supper that one of you is going to betray me, they all looked around and said, I, said, I. Well, his love was impartial. He loved everyone the same. They didn't just point to Jesus and scare, well, it's you. No, they didn't know. Because Jesus loved him, showed the same love to Peter and John that he did to Judas Iscariot. His love is the same today for us. And when we think about his love for us, the natural response should be like Paul. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. 
And so I want us to notice, first of all, his unwavering determination. Jesus sees us as lovable, teachable, and forgivable. He knew his crucifixion and resurrection would set us free from sin. And sin's deceptive, it's harmful, it's destructive. Just look at what's happening now. Look at how destructive it is in Ukraine. That is sin. It's destructive now in Shanghai when they have a lockdown because of COVID and people are starving in that 26 million population city. We see it. Why do we know Jesus had an unwavering determination to die on the cross for us? Because that's what he says. That's what he says. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and, and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Jesus replies by stating that he will complete his mission. Nothing will stop him. He said to them, go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I reached my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. The Apostle John records this when Jesus is at Jerusalem in the temple area. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. He knew what was about to happen to him. He had repeated it several times. We find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, repeated several times in both gospel accounts. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. A person, first of all, a person crucified was beaten with a leather whip. And that leather whip couldn't have bones at the end of it attached to it. As they flogged the skin until the blood flowed. Or if it didn't help, they would, they would flog until the blood did flow. If it didn't help, little bones. Scourging was not just done for cruelty, but it was done to hasten death. After the beating, Jesus carried his cross beam to the execution site. And Romans used the approach to signify that life was already over to break the will to live. In addition, the tablet detailing the crimes or crime was often placed around the criminal's neck and then fastened to the cross, which is what this tablet is. This is one of those tablets that's been discovered by archaeologists. The prisoner was often tied, the usual method, or nailed to the crossbeam at the crucifixion site. They place a small wooden block halfway up to provide a seat for the body, lest the nails tear open the wounds or the ropes force the arms out of their sockets. Next, the feet were tied to, to were tied or nailed to the post. And finally, the Roman soldiers lifted the beam with the body fixed to it. The loss of blood circulation and coronary heart failure caused death. I read this to remind us of how cruel his death was. When we think about excruciating pain, that word excruciating comes from crucifixion. That's the background of the word. And that Jesus, Jesus was determined to die such a death for us. What Peter wrote describes his determination of why he did it. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, that's commendable before God. To this you were called. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you. Leaving you an example. You should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. And no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you are like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus' love. He had full, complete love. We read examples of Jesus' impartial love. With many, the others would not help, but not even come near. Lepers. He helped those with disease, the blind. He even taught and associated with tax collectors and even Gentiles. The Romans had crucified thousands of people. But when Jesus died on the cross, he was different. Jesus didn't say much that day on the cross. Only six sentences. This is in English. <laughs> and only 35 words. But oh, what words they were, what power, what truth he spoke. After all the flogging, carrying his cross beam toward the hill, the nails piercing him, the excruciating pain he was experiencing, the mocking and the insults. According to Luke, the first words he said on the cross were, you remember this, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. He prayed on the cross. And he prayed like this. Seldom did men pray on the cross. And if they did, it wouldn't be a prayer like that. It would be a prayer of deliverance, not forgiveness. Crucifixion was to make death as painful as possible. Historical scholars have noted that it was usual for the victims of crucifixion to have unbearable pain, to shriek, to entreat, to curse. And yet, what did Jesus do? Jesus prayed. And what a prayer he prayed. Jesus' first thought was not of his own pain, but it was the harm that sin was causing in the lives of people. And so he prayed for those who were tormenting him. Jesus forgave, he was praying for them to be forgiven. The soldier. He prayed. For the soldier had crushed him to the ground, driving the blunt spikes into his hands. He prayed for him. He prayed for the people coming who were mocking him, belittling him, cursing him. And it's not surprising that Jesus prayed his prayer during this painful ordeal because Jesus was compassionate. He was loving. He was caring. And he was more than a good man. He was the son of God. How Jesus died on the cross is powerful. But there is more, something more spectacular and powerful even than that. Paul wrote this about Jesus. He says he was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh, the Romans, they knew about power. They wielded power. They worshiped power. And so if you were to ask them, who has the power? They would say, the emperor does. His armies do. That is the power. But contrary to their view, the one who had the power was God. And he used his great power to raise his son from the dead. And notice the implications of what Paul wrote. He said, his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. These four words, Jesus Christ, our Lord, are the fullest expression of who Jesus is. And, they, and significance packs each word. First, Jesus is the source of salvation. Matthew 1, 21, that's his name, Savior, Jesus. Second, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, the anointed one. The anointed one was king, and he is the king, the anointed one. And they had anticipated him coming, the Messiah coming for centuries. Here he is. And finally, Lord, which would be meaningful to the Roman Gentiles to whom he's writing. 
So the disciples, amazingly, <laughs> doubted Jesus' resurrection at first. Here's what happens according to Luke. The cross was not the end of Jesus' story because the resurrection follows that signifies a new beginning. Luke writes, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, they were angels. Other gospel accounts say. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Now there were Mary Magdalene and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter knows better than to doubt the Lord's word. During Peter's, Peter said, I'll never forsake you. And Jesus said, you'll deny me three times before the cock crows twice, and he did. He knew better now. He knew to accept Jesus' words. He said he would rise from the dead. And, but Peter got up. And he ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Talk about the need for patience. Jesus needed it with his disciples. After all the time that they spent with him, walking throughout Galilee and Judea for three years, and him telling them what will happen at Jerusalem. And that he will be raised on the third day. And here they are doubting it. He needed patience. But once they did. Once they realized. It became a great motivational factor for them all. Paul says. And I've already mentioned this part. Paul says for Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we celebrate his resurrection every Sunday. His resurrection gives us hope. His resurrection declares that we have a living Savior, and that when we submit to him, God saves us through his power and grace. Because God raised Jesus, God also will raise us with an eternal body when Jesus returns. So how should we respond? When Peter, John, and Paul realized the resurrection fully, they used what happened to Jesus to teach the immediate effects his resurrection has for us. Paul writes, We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Well, when did they die to sin? Well, then Paul explains it. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. In baptism, there's a symbolic relationship to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We see that when one goes down into the water, he's buried. And then when he's raised up out of the water, his sins are forgiven, all of his sins. And he walks, he's, a, he's a, a risen to live a new life. Because Jesus has now forgiven his, him of his sins. And so at that moment, God forgives us of our sins. And we start a fresh new life. We are resurrected from 
being dead in our sins and are made alive with Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 2. Here's another immediate effect. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we express our gratitude for what Jesus did for us. As we remember His death and His resurrection, we proclaim His death until He comes. Paul writes, he says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? He calls this cup the cup of thanksgiving. And when we take this cup of thanksgiving, are we taking it with gratitude in our hearts for all that Jesus has done for us? How often should we partake? Once a year? Once a quarter? Once a month? Well, this is what they did in the beginning, the first century. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. And breaking bread is a term for the Lord's Supper. So we remember what Jesus did for us every Sunday, as the first century church did. And we do this on the first, on the day that God raised Jesus from the dead, the first day of the week, which is Sunday. We do this just like the first century church did. They did it 52 times a year. That's what we do. It's that important. It's that important to remember his love. Someone has said that the Lord's day without the Lord's supper is the rose without the fragrance. The honeycomb from which all the sweetness has been extracted. Paul writes, for, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Proclaiming his death until he comes. That means that he's not dead. But alive. Resurrected. Peter makes the fact that Jesus is alive when he teaches about baptism. He says in, in it only a few people. He's talking about Noah and the, and the flood at this point. In chapter 3 of 1 Peter. In it only a few people ate and all were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right side with angels and authorities and authorities in submission to him. And so the apostles use Jesus' resurrection to teach what happens to us at baptism. That we arise and we start a new life. They use the Lord's Supper to teach the significance of Jesus' death on the cross and how we are to remember what He had done, has done for us with thanksgiving in our hearts. And at that time, we also proclaim His resurrection until He comes again. We have a living Savior. Finally, they use His death to give us hope. Showing us how much he loves us and how we are to follow in his steps. So that brings me back to this slide again that I started with originally and got lost. But this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Now we don't have that opportunity very often, do we? We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Children, let us not love with words and tongue, but with actions and in truth. So let's do that. Let's reflect the love of Jesus in our heart to others around us. They need hope. They need encouragement. So Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, if you haven't come to Jesus. And met him in the waters of baptism. Where he meets you as your master, your savior. And he washes your sins away. Or if you have another need this morning. You want the church to pray for you. 
or whatever might be the need, won't you come as we stand and as we sing. Oh, I'm not ashamed. 